And so now we go to part two of National Socialism and the Economy. In this one, we will be looking at the different stages of economic policy and what influenced them. You've seen the learning outcomes, here they be. And so we come to the actual economic policies themselves. But before we go there, it's important to realize that um, the 1930s was a period of international recovery from uh, economic depression for everybody. And this also uh, happened in Germany. So a lot of people walk away with the idea that Hitler was um, really good at creating a powerful industry which uh, helped um, end unemployment, et cetera, et cetera. And the economy did perform well until about 1939, but he wasn't so interested in um, improving living standards for people, but was more interested in uh, developing an industrial economy which would be able to support war. And Hitler himself was not an economic planner, um, and most of that work he divested to his economic ministers. But the one thing that he really insisted on was to prepare Germany for rearmament. So when we look at these economic policies, what we're looking at is not a coherent, cohesive economic policy, but different strategies followed by different ministers trying to um, meet Hitler's wishes in different ways. The first stage of Nazi economic policy lasted from 1933 to 36 under economic minister Schacht. Uh, and the purpose of this was to reduce unemployment while working to control wages and get rid of trade unions. And as you know, uh, one of the first things that you have to do when you establish your single party state is begin to address the uh, situation that brought you into power in the first place. And that first, the, the most important thing for people at the time was the um, economic troubles of the Great Depression. And of course, you want to get rid of trade unions because, you know, trade unions are largely um, on the left and um, could become a source of uh, opposition to the government. And so, however, we can say here that the actions and implementation of this was more practical than ideological. Uh, and again, Schott was the economics minister. And this guy, uh, had been or still was um, a really important banker during the Weimar Republic. And during that time, he had shown great skill in working with the economy. He was the guy behind the plan that stabilized the German currency after the hyperinflation. And he was not a Nazi, but he actually founded the German um, Democratic Party. He wasn't a Nazi, but he was very interested in making Germany great again. And basically he said he would do anything to do that and um, join up with anybody to do that. And the other thing about him is that he had been really instrumental to Hitler's rise because um, in the early 1930s, he had encouraged the major industrial companies to support Hitler with money and, um, and votes. And so this uh, support from the industrial sector was one of the prongs that really helped Hitler to uh, rise to power. And one of the things he did as economic minister is he established this um, uh, organization called <laughs> Organization of Industry. And it was made up of, uh, of uh, businesses and employers associations and finance houses. And its purpose was to increase um, trade and industry. And it worked really well because it was an organization of essentially the elites of industry. And uh, it showed that, um, I guess, Germany was working to improve its, its, its economy and its industry, and we have a concerted effort happening. Therefore, this really helped because it increased foreign investment. People started giving Germany loans again, loans that could be used to invest in its industry and kind of jumpstart everything again. 
He also believed that the government should tax, but that the taxes should be fairly assessed. So you don't want to tax so heavily uh, as to create a burden on those who could least afford it. And um, it should be reinvested in productive ways. And one of the other things that he was able to do uh, was to create bilateral trade agreements between Germany and the Balkan states. A number of these states will later on join with Germany um, in World War II and uh, with South America. And so this provided Germany with cheap raw materials to feed uh, her, her domestic industry and in return, the, these countries who themselves were suffering from Great Depression received income because uh, what they primarily did provide initially was raw materials. And, uh, but this also meant that Germany was investing in those countries and therefore jumpstarting and boosting their economies. And they also had access to German manufactured goods, which uh, they could not produce themselves. One of the most important things that Schott put into place is this new plan, which was implemented in September 1934. And its purpose was to regulate in imports and direct foreign exchange to the important sectors of the economy. So the idea is to kind of um, limit imports in some ways so that uh, you have more money staying within the country and then directing the money that they received, especially from selling their own goods, into the sectors of the economy that would do the most um, good, that is, would be the most beneficial to the economy. And so one of the other main things in doing this is to decrease unemployment. And the idea, of course, is if people are unemployed, they are not spending money. And spending money is kind of like, um, has that multiplier effect, which then would, theref would provide income to industries who would then be able to employ more people, who would then have more money, et cetera, et cetera. And it had a two-prong um, program um, in addition to, to, they had a two-prong program to decrease this unemployment in addition to um, rebuilding the um, important economic sectors. One was public spending. And the idea is to um, create public works projects such as road repairs, um, forest clearing, building new schools and hospitals. This is when we have the Autobahn being set up in place. And this meant that you actually have deficit spending by the government, but by putting money in people's hands, um, you have that multiplier effect happening. You will then be able to reduce that deficit spending um, through increased uh, income from taxes of employed people. And then the other thing is they established um, this national labor service. And the idea here is young men between the ages of 18 and 25 were required to work for the National Labor Service for six months. And this provided, of course, with a cheap source of, of, of workers, but it also trained them in basic skills. And that way you could also put them to work where you needed them to. And this allowed you to increase the skill level of your society and then be able to have them enter into other sectors of the, of the economy to improve it. Um, but by the end, uh, they couldn't continue to import food and industrial raw materials. And so uh, brings us to the next bit, rearmament. Um, Hitler's main objective was increasing the um, military strength of the country. And uh, Schott knew that he had to uh, provide some money for this uh, rearmament. However, it's that classic debate about guns versus butter. Hitler wants more guns. Schott realizes that you still need to have some butter happening because if you put, take all of the money away to, to uh, invest it in the army, then that would ultimately undermine um, economic recovery. And so his idea was that uh, this rearmament would happen in stages. And by 1935, he would have more money 
to um, uh, invest in rearmament. And the money was coming available, however, it wasn't fast enough for Hitler. And Hitler basically said that if the army is not armed and ready to go as quickly as possible and basically the best army in Europe, then Germany would be lost. And because it wasn't fast enough for Hitler, um, Schott is uh, sidelined in favor of Gehring, which brings us to the next stage of uh, economic policy. The second phase of, uh, of Nazi economic policy runs from 1936 to 1939 and is called, imaginatively, the four-year plan. As stated previously, Hitler was tired of Schott's cautious and slow planning, and he wanted to um, improve the economy much more quickly, improve manufacturing much more quickly, and be ready for war. And so Schott is, is replaced with Goering, and if you remember, Goering has been uh, part of, the, um, of Hitler's inner circle for a very long time. And uh, Goering implements the four-year plan, and he undermines Schott, who resigns in November 1937. And so the four-year plan had, um, the purpose of the four-year plan was to attain self-sufficiency industrially and agriculturally. So this was to achieve autarky. And in order to do this, um, one of the first things is stricter import controls. That is limiting the uh, amounts of goods, especially manufactured goods, imported into the country. And this would help uh, support German manufacturing. And then the other thing, of course, is tighter control of the labor force. So essentially, you need the labor force to be working for you um, whenever you, whenever and where, wherever you want them to. And pretty much between um, uh, the N National Labor Service and conscription, they had reached near 100% near employment by the end of this. And the other thing that they were supposed to be doing here is try to, again, in the name of autarky and in preparation for war, reduce their dependency on foreign imp uh, imported oil. That is, they have to develop um, alternatives for oil, for, for oil and other important items, such as, for example, um, motor oil was developed to work in uh, manufacturing industry, and that meant that they reduced their dependency on importing uh, oil from the tropical areas. These, these are colonies controlled by other Western European countries, and these tropical oils were needed to grease the machinery, literally, so that they wouldn't fall apart during production. And then by 1935, they were supposed to make clear preparation for war. So that is um, a shift toward a more um, uh, industrially, military, military good um, uh, oriented economy. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ultimately, there was a steady spending on the military. So from 1.9 billion marks in 1936, the 32.8 in um, 1938. And you can also see, looking at the graph below, that unemployment also fell dramatically in terms of from 1932, six million unemployed, and by the second half of 1938, you have 200,000 unemployed. There was some progress made, but they did not make their goals for pr producing synthetic rubber and synthetic fuel and for efficient use of low quality um, coal and iron ore. So by the time on the, uh, we get to the eve of war, Germany is still importing a third of her industrial raw materials and importing 19% of food. And so this is going to make her quite vulnerable um, ultimately. Which brings us to red letters. Yay! Uh, looking at these two charts, what do they say about the extent of economic recovery and government economic investment? The first one in the upper left looks at the growth in German manufacturing 
And so that index of 100 in 1936 means that that, 100, that 1936 year is, spent, is, is set at like kind of the zero mark. So you can see uh, what years were above or below, right? And then um, the second graph looks at the average wave rates of industrial workers. Have fun. Which brings us to the third stage, and this is from 1939 to 1941, after World War War had begun, when Germany's war fighting strategy is a blitzkrieg, which means lightning war. And here, the purpose of lightning war, um, this was their strategy at the beginning, and we'll talk about this more when we talk about World War II, is a, a way to achieve milita military victory by not fully mobilizing the economic resources. And so the idea is you strike hard, you strike fast, um, and uh, you give it all you have, and, and you win, so you don't have to go into total war. And so with this blitzkrieg, Germany was able to absorb Poland, Denmark, Norway, the Low Countries, and France. And in this case, um, so bringing us up to here, and this is why they're able to do it, Armed spending went from 0.8 billion marks in 32 to 17.2 billion marks in 1938. And so uh, what you have seen from the previous chart, this seems that it's contradictory to um, the numbers that I gave before. But there's a difference between armed spending, which is the guns, and military spending, which is actually um, the soldiers and uh, equipment and logistics and all of that. So between 1936 and 1939, in order to prepare for Blitzkrieg, 66% of industrial investment went into war production. So they were prepared for Blitzkrieg, but then when it becomes total war, which brings us to the fourth stage of German economic policy uh, under the Nazis, and this is from 1941 to 45, total war. Prior to this, um, uh, the Germany had been operating under the Blitzkrieg system, and there was no need to fully mobilize the economy. The other thing is, prior to this, there was also limited central planning of the war effort. Because of the way Hitler organized his government, you had a number of different organs of the government um, trying to organize the economy, organize military uh, spending and planning and production. And of course, you have the rivalry between the different organizations, so there was limited sharing of information and the whole process wasn't streamlined. Albert Speer, I put a first name in there for you, Max, is appointed the Minister of Armaments and War Production. And this essentially streamlines it into one office and under one person. and. And he was given quite a lot of freedom, um, as were a lot of people, because that's how Hitler rolled, in how and uh, he was going to make this happen. And essentially, he streamlined um, transport and freight movements, and so uh, materials were better able to reach the plants, the manufacturing plants on schedule. And um, if you look at, when you see the graph that comes below, he was actually able to increase production despite the fact that, he would, that they were being um, heavily bombed um, during this time period by the Allies. So overall, we have rapidly increased arms production. Um, with the invasion of the Soviet Union, the economy is going to have to be fully, fully um, mobilized toward the war effort and human resources are going to have to be fully mobilized toward the war effort. Uh, Germany is fighting a war on two fronts now, and so um, everything has to be thrown in. The economy, however, despite everything that they could do, the economy was still outproduced by, that, um, by the economies of the Soviet Union, the US, and the United Kingdom. And if you look at this graph down here, you can see from 41 to 44, the um, amount that was produced. And then by the time we get to 44, with the heavy bombings, with the um, 
uh, the capturing of, of allies and also basically cordoning off of Germany, production starts to decrease. The other thing that has to be said here is the reason why production was able to uh, work at this level for this long is one, the entirety of the German um, uh, workforce, including women, were uh, mobilized, right? So the entirety of the workforce was mobilized. The second thing is that um, slave labor. Essentially, the populations of the countries that Hitler occupied were forced to go to work um, and to produce uh, armaments, and they weren't paid, hence the word slave labor, and they weren't taken care of. So in a way, um, Speer and Germany, um, they were able to really, really minimize their costs uh, and increase production. It's a sad way of looking at it, but that's essentially uh, how it worked. <laughs>